Hello, and welcome to Pegasus Presents Peggy Pods. The Pegasus Research Consortium is a think tank designed for exchanging ideas on alternative science in the world we live in. It can be located through www.thelivingmoon.com. Join us while we venture into the inner workings and interesting lives of our guests on the show. My name is Dwem, and I will be tonight's host. Our co-host tonight will be Amaterasu Solar. You can also find us on Pegasus' website, affectionately known to us as Peggy. Joining us today in the guest chair is one of our Pegasus Forum members, Robert Garrison, a.k.a. Robomont, or as we like to call him, Robo. Hello, Robo. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm doing real wonderful. I'm glad to be here with uh, the group, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I plan to do a report for y'all on uh, history and then go into my theories on how flying saucers actually work. Oh, anti-gravity. Uh, as you know, we're all into that. Yes, that seems to be one of the, our primary goals on Pegasus. Uh, we welcome anybody who would like to become a member of the group. It's free. All you have to do is sign up. Um, we're a very happy group. We're, we work very professionally and uh, with each other. And um, it's been a real pleasure being a member of Pegasus. And I invite anybody who would like a professional discussion. Uh, they're welcome to join right on in. You can find Robo and myself both on Pegasus. So I hope you... Come and join the crowd. Now, Robo, or Robert, um, you have a lot of interesting theories that we'd like to talk about. And uh, would you like to open the floor with one of them? Um, yes, I'm going to start off with the history of uh, static electricity as I've learned it over the, over the years and give, you, give some highlights of what I feel is important um, so that you'll have a good foundation upon which to imagine my descriptions in uh, the later part of this program. So for those uh, listening, static electricity, like walking over a carpet and touching your sweetheart and seeing a spark? Exactly. It, it even goes on. Um, originally, when it was first, well, when it was first discovered in our, in our um, humankind, um, there was a lot of research being done in the late 1800s around the 1890s and into approximately 1930 and at which point a lot of it just tended to disappear from mainstream science. I believe this was done intentionally. I have no real proof of it, but if you will, if you happen to do the research, you'll find that it's just like it just all disappeared around approximately, I'm going to say between the 1930s and 1950. By approximately 1950, there was almost no scientific research being published for the general public. And uh, that's why I believe it was all moved into the, the black world or the, the top secret world. So static electricity went black and the only thing we're left with is rubbing balloons on our hair, right? So all the technicality that's, behind uh, it. That, that's pretty close to exact. Um, you know, uh, here, kids, put your hand on this Van de Graaff generator and watch your hair stick up. <laughs> um, that's really technical. You know, you know, that's, that's that's basically all they'll give you about it. And um, even today in the physics classes, you hear very little about it. If, if a physics class actually has a Van de Graaff generator nowadays, it's, um, it's very rare. I haven't seen so one today, myself in 30 years. Uh, the, the, I, I know of very few of them. Uh, when I spoke to my daughter a few months ago, she said they didn't have one in her physics class. And uh, this today's date is uh, uh, 2014. And um, I believe this, this field of study should be a lot more intense and they should have these machines available for students to experiment with. And so to all physics teachers out there, I recommend buying a, a Van de Graaff generator. A decent one costs about three to four hundred dollars. And um, the potential for the child to learn so much, the student to learn so much is there. 
if the teacher is willing to delve off into the field. $300 is not exactly breaking the bank for any teachers or any school budget. Can you give me an example of what they would learn in school? Well, as we know, uh, two positive charges and two negative charges will repel each other. Uh, let me start from the beginning, and um, sure, not... we'll move on up to that static charge. Okay. Um, and, um, in 1904, there was a man called George S. Pigot. It's P-I-G-G-O-T-T. And he wrote an article called Overcoming Gravitation. And in it, he's using a high-voltage apparatus along with a bunch of condensers, which today we would call capacitors. And he was able to levitate metal balls off the floor using another metal ball that was statically charged. Um, <clears throat> people back then were already beginning to try to figure out what was going on with, with gravity. The machine that he used at the, term, at the time was called a Wimshurst generator, W-I-M-S-H-U-R-S-T. Now, these generators would typically run between 10,000 volts DC and approximately 25,000 volts DC. The bigger, they were basically two metal plates or two glass plates with uh, metal spots uh, equally spaced out on these plates, and the plates would counter-rotate. And as these plates counter-rotated, they would build up a charge, and then uh, they would have metal balls attached to it for high voltage experiments. Now these these plates would put out a really good current supply. So and uh, and when I say current, I'm talking about amps. And we'll get into that more too. Um, basically, this procedure that I talk about has to do with high voltage DC, which is voltage, and the low current that is needed to make these these flying saucers work. DC is very dangerous, right? More dangerous than AC? No, that's what Edison tried to scare everybody with when he electrocuted an animal using AC because he was competing against Nikola Tesla's um, AC at the time. Uh, Edison was like the DC king and Nikola Tesla was like the AC king. And they were competing to power New York with electricity and so Edison decided that he would try to scare everybody. But basically, they're both de deadly at, if the, the voltages and the currents are high enough. Even a flying saucer should not be touched. You should not walk up to one and touch it immediately after it lands because there's a high probability it will kill you. Oh, okay. Hands off, huh? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, a matter of fact, because of the high voltage DC, there is a high probability of x-rays coming off the metal of the craft. And so that's where the exposure to radiation some people get after having a close encounter. Usually that radiation range is somewhere in the x-ray, the hard x-ray region, up to the gamma ray region. And if the craft has any metal on it, those uh, parts will be radioactive. If the craft is made of aluminum, then you'll have approximately a two-minute window uh, where the half-life of the metal is irradiating. And after about approximately two minutes, then it is, is you have a higher probability of it being safe to touch, as long as the craft's power is turned off. Well, I can see that we're going to have to buy a lot of decals, like the no smoking sign, say don't touch with a line through it, so the kids stay away from the saucer when it lands. Okay, let's get back to 1904. Continue, please. Well, so after 1904, there was a man uh, by the name of Berkland uh, in 1908 that started doing some experiments with high voltage in a cloud chamber. And what he found was he was able to create clouds around um, his high voltage apparatus. And um, as some people have talked about seeing a UFO and then a cloud forms around it and it disappears, or they think a UFO might be a cloud, but they don't know for sure. That is one of the functions that a UFO can do. It can draw moisture out of the air and condense it around the craft to where it looks like a fog. I bring this up because these are experiments that have been basically lost to time, and 
if you want to look them up, um, Berkland's had, he wrote a book called On the Cause of Magnetic Storms. The book was published in 1908. And so I just, I wanted to add that in there as a little bit of history so that people will know, have a better idea of what's going on. Um, and also to show that these experiments um, are like a hundred years old and still can be, re can be used in theory even today. Um, yes, uh, in my own work even, I, I often equate uh, flying saucers to lightning because they both disturb, they have atmospheric disturbance and it shows up very well. So that much voltage in the air is going to do something. All right, now the next thing I bring up, and you can find this in almost any college physics book, it's called the Millikan Oil Drop Experiment. Millikan, M-I-L-L-I-K-A-N. Millikan, in 1909, did an experiment where he got a water droplet to levitate by statically charging it using an x-ray beam. And so here is the first, we really start hearing about x-rays. And um, this droplet, was able, he was able to keep it levitated as long as it had a static charge. Well, this, this Millikan oil drop experiment is basically a reference to the Earth and what is going on with the static charge of the Earth. And um, so I wanted to bring that in there so that if people are saying, well, th this guy is crazy, and say, no, here is an object being levitated by a real physicist in a lab that almost every physics book has an example of it. Drop uh, oil like you would get out of an eyedropper, something like that? Yes, an oil, an oil drop or a water droplet, but this, this was an atomizer, so the droplet was very, very small. It was visible with a microscope, but it did levitate. And that's okay. the fact that, well, this, um, this atomization of these particles or this oil drop was um, levitated, so we know it is possible to levitate, levitate objects if the voltage is high enough. Now, people will say, well, how am I going to get this, uh, this voltage? Well, with Millikan, what he was using was an X-ray pointed at this, at this oil drop, and it ionized, it charged that oil drop with a, uh, a high-voltage charge. Now, X-rays, if you look in a physics book, they are of approximately what is called um, 100,000 electron volts. So basically what that tells you is you're going to need an energy supply that will put out 100,000 electron volts. A good example of this is a Van de Graaff generator. A Van de Graaff generator, if it runs at around 100,000 volts, is putting off x-rays. Very few, but it is putting them off. And they're, they're, they're so few, they're really not dangerous, but they can be dangerous if the current was high enough on the Van de Graaff generator. Most uh, Van de Graaff generators that are used in physics classes do not have the current, so there's very few x-rays coming off of them. But just for future reference, yes, they do put off x-rays. Well, now, how many amps are we usually talking about in a school, one of those $300 machines? But, I mean, am I going to send my kid to school? Yeah, your, tip, your typical three-foot Van de Graaff generator with a ball on top that's like 10 inches in diameter, is putting off approximately 100,000 volts, and its current is about 0.001 to 0 0.0001, from 100 to 1,000th of an amp. Oh, not much. Very, very, very little. Very little. But it, it, the okay. thing is, it doesn't take a lot of power. If you multiply 100,000 volts, 100,000 times 0 .001, you end up with, you know, maybe uh, 1,000 watts, which is one kilowatt, you know, I mean, I'm not doing the math exactly, but generally speaking, 100. yeah, 100, so you're not really talking about that much power, all right, well, when a, when a, what most people are confused about and what science tries to confuse people about is that, let's say, for example, your UFO weighs a 1,000 pounds. Well, if you put that UFO on a rope and a pulley and you hook a horse to it, that horse can lift that UFO. 
So basically, it takes one horsepower to lift a small UFO, a thousand pound UFO. The, now people say, oh, no, no, there's no way, there's no way. No, if you get 100% efficiency, which is highly possible with a UFO, if even if you get 80% efficiency, that horse can lift that UFO as long as it's around 1,000 pounds. And over a pulley? Yeah, and, and I'm only using a pulley as a reference because it's easy for people to understand how the, the, the process works with horsepower. So it's, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a, um, a 10,000 pound UFO, well, then it's going to take about five to seven horsepower to lift it. It's not very much. Your common home generator runs approximately five horsepower. It's, it's not a lot of energy, even though, no, if you we, look, even, even though if you look on a lot of these UFO shows, they talk about millions of horsepower and there's no way you can do this. Look, the physics and the math says differently. Now, who are you going to believe? Some paid chill on TV or some physics book. Preferably, I, I choose a physics book. Yes, five horsepower is not a lot. We have air conditioners here that run five horsepower all the time. In our homes, is usually anywhere from one to three horsepower. But in business, they're always five. So it's a very well-known number. And that, okay. that, that's, that's, that's all that's really necessary. The only thing is that horsepower has to be converted into voltage, and it has to be high voltage. It has to be high enough to put a corona around your UFO. And this, this corona is what is acting on the air around the flying saucer. It, it, it is statically charging the air around the flying saucer. Okay, uh, Robert, what we want to do right now is we want to cut to commercial. And after we come back from our little Pegasus ad, uh, my co-host, Amar Tarazu Solar, will be joining us, and she'll be asking you some questions also. So stay tuned. Enjoy the commercial. We'll be right back. Welcome to TheLivingMoon.com. Here you'll find many interesting topics presented by the best in their fields. Starting off with the owner, Zorgon, who runs the place. Follow the Honorable John Lear in his discussions as he ventures into the depths of our nearest neighbor's secrets, including his own set of alternative theories that the moon has an atmosphere and more gravity than expected. If you wish to step into one of the best forums on the planet, enter the Pegasus Research Consortium, where you might lose yourself in many a rabbit hole. Dig deep into moon and Martian anomalies. Follow the live LRO tracking system. Enter the Members Hall of Fame and discover stargates, scientific research, radio and video interviews of John Lear, future technologies, the wisdom of the ancients, image analysis work, study of the moon's bases and orbital craft. Continue with a tour through the electronic universe and anti-gravity studies of all kinds, and a huge collection of UFO studies past and present. And this is just a teaser www.thelivingmoon.com is the place to do research on so many subjects it's hard to list them all. Don't forget to sign up. Membership is free. And all the good stuff is behind the membership curtain. And welcome back to Pegasus Presents, Peggy Pods. And today we're talking to Robert Garrison, a.k.a. Robomot, or as we love to call him, Robo. And again, joining me is my co-host, Ms. Amartarazzo Solar, uh, affectionately known to us in Pegasus as Amy. Hello, Amy. How are you? Pretty good. How are you? Not bad. we got a really good, interesting show going on with Robomot, or Robo, and he's discussing all sorts of static electricity, high voltage, AC, DC, and going all the way back to the turn of the century in 1904. And Robo, I'd like to turn the show back over to you. Uh, we left off in 1909, and you were mentioning 1963 is coming up, June 25th. Go. 
forgot to put it on your list there, uh, Dwem, but in approximately the 1950s, uh, we have a man ta- named Townsend Brown. And Townsend Brown uh, created some levitating craft using high-voltage DC. From what I understand, his original experiments were in the 15,000 to 25,000 volt DC range. It was, um, at this time, he was able to get a small object to levitate using high voltage. And then later on, he was able to create a larger disc uh, using uh, 100,000 volts and got it to move really, really fast and got it to levitate real well. AC or DC? Now, uh, this will, all, all this discussion will be about high voltage DC, okay. direct current. Um, one of the, so we've got this man named Townsend Brown that comes out in the 50s, and this is approximately when high-voltage experiments start disappearing from the science community. We, we start hearing just less and less. It's almost like it just drops off the face of the planet. Well, at this time, uh, right after this, there was a man named H.C. Dudley, Horace Dudley. And in June 25th, 1963, he applied, or no, let's see here, January 5th, 1960, he applied for the patent um, called the Apparatus for the Promotion and Control of Vehicular Flight. It's patent number 3,095,167. It was um, released on June 25th, 1963. In his patent, on the very first page of it, it, show, it shows a picture of the Earth, and it shows the Earth as being positively charged. It has a little rocket ship that is shown to be positively charged. Then it shows a horizontal line above the Earth with the word ionosphere out beside it. And it has, a, uh, in writing, 350,000 volts negative. Then above that line, it has another line that says 650,000 volts negative, and out beside it, it says Van Allen belt. Now, what this shows is that the Earth is charged positively and that there is a negative field. The further you get out into space, the higher the voltage gradient on this negative field. So basically, uh, what we have here in this patent is that the Earth is statically charged. And as you get further out from the planet, the voltage gradient increases. And because of this theory, it would, this is what I'm trying to get people to understand, is that its high-voltage craft works off the static electric repulsion of the field gradient of the planets and even the sun and even the galaxies and even the universe. Each one has a higher and higher voltage gradient. This pattern that I talk about supposedly was shot down by NASA. But and what I've seen over the years is NASA has an agenda, and it doesn't always fit with what the truth is. So anytime um, I hear of a NASA opinion, I take it with a grain of salt, and I ask that the audience does too, because back in the day, in the 60s, they weren't just issuing patents to anybody. You had to prove your theory. It's only recently in the last 20 or 30 years that a patent can be applied and given to somebody without proving their theory. And so I would ask our audience, remember that. (laughs) Now, because of this voltage gradient, this is what, it's basically like different levels away from the earth. And each one of these levels is the energy that will be repelled against. Just like two positive charges repel or two negative charges repel. And that's what I'm getting into next. With these, uh, with Townsend Brown, his, his flying saucer apparatus was basically a capacitor. It was two metal plates separated by an insulator. A good example of an insulator nowadays is the cutting boards that are used in restaurants. They are called Teflon and they are a form of dielectric. Oh, I have one of those. Air, air can also be a dielectric. In the old days, in the 1900s, that was basically what they used as their insulator. 
and one plate would be positively charged and one plate would be negatively charged. Now when we talk about these positive and negative charges, this is all relative. I have no proof of this, but how can we know for sure that we're on a positively charged planet and not a negatively charged planet, or vice versa? I'm sure there's some genius geek out there that can prove it to us for sure, but at the moment, I do not know and have no reference as to the fact. But we do know that there are differences in this charge. All right. So imagine in your head, you have this flying saucer. It is made of two plates with an insulator in between them. The top plate would be negatively charged, and the bottom plate would be positively charged. Because the bottom plate is positively charged, it is repelling against the earth. Because the top plate is negatively charged, it is pulling towards outer space. And because you say, well, why would a negative and a negative? Because the top plate of the UFO is negatively charged to say 100,000 volts, well, in a voltage gradient of 650,000 volts, what you have is you have a difference of charge, which to that 650,000 volt gradient makes it look like the top plate of the UFO is actually positively charged. I know this sounds weird, but it's because of the math. When one plate or one object is lower has a lower voltage gradient, then the surrounding air, then basically what you have is a positive and a negative charge. Just because one is 650,000 volts and the other one is 10,000 volts, there is no repulsion. Both have to be of equal charge or equal voltage for there to be repulsion. So in the case of a UFO, because the top plate is negatively charged but is in a gradient of, say, 650,000 volts, and if that plate is, say, 100,000 volts, then what you actually have is you have a pulling force and not a pushing force. So now you have a plate on the top that is pulling. You have a plate on the bottom that is pushing. These two plates are what calls a UFO to fly. It is the static electric charge of repulsion, just like the Millikan oil drop experiment. You have something that is charged that is pushing away from the Earth. Now, this so, is where, um, go ahead, Dwem. So, what happens to you if you're on the inside? Do you get pushed, pulled, electrocuted? How do you, get, how do you keep from on staying the out of these fields? Um, they, the dielectric, or the air, would be your insulator. Well, when you're using high voltage and, and, and um, a narrow spacing, it's best to have some form of an insulator inside, and maybe even a Faraday cage. This will protect you just in case there was arcing between the plates. And that's why inside of the craft or the craft body itself will be of a high dielectric. Usually, in my opinion, the craft will have a positive plate or a positive point or some kind of a positive reference on the bottom of the craft and a negative reference on the top of the craft. Amy. Excuse me, Robo. Amy, uh, I think we got to warm up the saucer and go for a ride now that we know where all the dials should be turned. <laughs> it sounds like it. You know, I Robo, know. you're getting me interested here. Uh, we got to build a Pegasus flying saucer for sure. I think so. Well, think if, with the sale of this DVD, maybe we'll be <laughs> able to get enough money together to where we can do that. With Amy's talents in the with graphics field, she'll be able to detail the outside of the saucer. Pretty cool. <laughs> I, I, I'm hoping. Uh, <laughs> we are going to have one honking UFO, I can guarantee you, Robo. <laughs> okay, so, so we're um, inside the craft. Continue from inside the craft for a moment there. I'd like to know how I don't get electrocuted. So, so you back to the well, Faraday this, cage? All right, so you have this hot dielectric. All right. Um, uh, in the old days, there, the, the best dielectric we had um, for the average Joe was what was called Bakelite, which was an early form of plastic. Nowadays, we have high dielectrics that would just blow Bakelite away. Even the Teflon that I talk about, the white cutting board, is a very, very high dielectric, 
and very cheap to make. And if you was to put a, uh, let's say, a quarter inch sheet of it underneath the metal dome of the craft and above the lower part of the metal dome of the bottom part of the craft, that would probably be enough to protect you from getting uh, electrocuted. You could also put what is called a Faraday cage around the console area, the command center, where Captain Kirk would sit. And this is basically <laughs> just a uh, metal mesh that is um, insulated from the positive plate and insulated from the negative plate. And anything within this ball, this ball of metal mesh, is protected due to Faraday's law and the Faraday cage. And so uh, that, that is how you would protect the individual. There's another way to do it, which is to use a gas within the craft. And you could, you could put your command center in this pod, we'll say, and then surround this pod with like pure hydrogen. And pure hydrogen makes a great dielectric. Plus, it adds a little bit of uh, buoyancy to where if the craft is, say, near the Earth, it would keep the craft from actually touching the Earth and uh, keep it, you know, a, a foot or two above if the inside of the craft, you know, had hydrogen in it. It would increase the buoyancy of the craft. Well, uh, on, an, uh, on another show you, we had, Robo, on another show we had Area 51 speak up that he said via Bob Lazar that the craft on the inside looked like it was molded, like almost in one piece, like they'd be stamping these out at some factory. So I'm wondering if it was some type of uh, plastic or whatever that would help the um, help the interior people from being electrocuted. Like that, you said, that's, they, that's, that's a high probability. Uh, we now have uh, 3D printers that can uh, print out little small objects. And just here in the last few months, it's come out that there will be 3D printers for houses that uh, put out uh, liquid concrete and uh, this robotic machine will actually 3D print, print your house out of concrete. Yes, they're so already doing that. Make, oh, that sounds yeah. awesome. So they're already doing that, that, Robo. Yeah. So it would they're make common it. sense that they, mm -hmm. they could 3D print out of craft out of a dielectric material. Wow, I'm going to need to buy a big 3D printer. Amy, do we have that in the budget? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we can I, schedule it for the budget when we <laughs> have it together. <laughs> That's a big 3D printer. Yes, so, indeed. Hey, once, it's paid, once it's paid for, we can use it over and over again as long as we can get the raw materials. So right. we don't have to just build... <laughs> just build one build millions right just keep them going day and night that's right yeah, uh, that I'm way the, the mass population can all have one yeah and then as soon as you make enough of them we can buy more 3d printers and just keep them pumping out all over the world if you want well just, like just as in with the gold mining days it was the stores that sold the gold mining products that made the money well um, i would suggest it will be the people who manufacture the raw materials that will actually be the real money makers, not the people creating the 3D printed flying saucers. Hmm. Robo, I'd like to get back to Dudley. Can you fill us a little bit more on that? We sort of stopped at uh, three or 650,000 volts. Where does it go from well, there? Well, that was, a, well, with the Van Allen zone, it, it starts at, from what this patent says, it starts at about 650,000 volts negative. And it doesn't have a number because basically it's infinity. If you go to the deepest, darkest parts of space, it could be in the billions or trillions of volts. And so um, basically what you're looking at is this ever-expanding voltage gradient that is, that ha you know, it's not in steps. It's a general curve or slope. And um, I do not know, I haven't been to the deep dark space, so I cannot tell you what the maximum voltage gradient would be. Like I said before, every object in space has this voltage gradient as far as I know. And the moon has a voltage gradient, the planets have a voltage gradient, the sun has a voltage gradient, the galaxy has a voltage gradient, and the universe has a voltage gradient. And in each step, it gets higher, bigger, stronger, higher voltage. Because I agree with this, those gradients, yes. Even in light, light has gradients. 
So yes, why not? Yes. Yeah, we we see we see gradients in almost every energy field out there. Sure, and it is these these static electric charges that I point out is the real reason that flying saucers can fly all over space and all over the earth and everything. And I would also like to suggest that they're probably the most efficient craft that there is when it comes to motion because they're taking direct electricity and turning it into direct motion. There could be some minor performance issues just due to the density of the air or the density of outer space, which we all know to be a vacuum. But there is even different gradients of vacuums in outer space. That's why deep, deep space would probably have a even lower vacuum than the space just between the Earth and the Moon, at the middle point between the Earth and the Moon. Okay, uh, Amy, you ready for that ride yet? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, Robo, uh, what I'd like to do now is cut to commercial again, and we'll come back with segment three in a minute. And uh, when we come back, I want you to teach us how we can turn UFOs. So far, I'm thinking we can go up and down, but what are your, what are your ideas or theories on how, how we can make them turn, okay? We'll be back in a minute after this commercial. Welcome to TheLivingMoon.com. Here you'll find many interesting topics presented by the best in their fields. Starting off with the owner, Zorgon, who runs the place. Follow the Honorable John Lear in his discussions as he ventures into the depths of our nearest neighbor's secrets, including his own set of alternative theories that the moon has an atmosphere and more gravity than expected. If you wish to step into one of the best forums on the planet, Enter the Pegasus Research Consortium, where you might lose yourself in many a rabbit hole. Dig deep into moon and Martian anomalies. Follow the live LRO tracking system. Enter the Members Hall of Fame and discover stargates, scientific research, radio and video interviews of John Lear, future technologies, the wisdom of the ancients, image analysis work, study of the moon's bases and orbital craft. Continue with a tour through the electronic universe and anti-gravity studies of all kinds, and a huge collection of UFO studies, past and present. And this is just a teaser. www.thelivingmoon.com is the place to do research on so many subjects, it's hard to list them all. Don't forget to sign up. Membership is free, and all the good stuff is behind the membership curtain. And now we're back with segment three. Today we're interviewing Robert Garrison, a.k.a. Robomot, known to us as Robo. And also joining me still is Amatrazzo Solar. Amy, take it. So, Robo, I'm very curious about how the uh, UFOs might be able to navigate, you know, turn and, and move in various directions. What sort of uh, ideas do you have on that? I have two theories. I have a basic theory on how it's done, and I have an advanced theory on how it's done. In the basic theory, if you have this craft and it's levitating in, in response to the charge field of the planet, uh, we'll just say Earth right now, one way to do it would just be basically to shift the weight inside the craft. You could have three water tanks and mm -hmm. or four water tanks and uh, have a water line with a little pump that would transfer water out of one tank over into another tank, thus basically leaning the craft in the direction that you're pointing to go. Okay. Now, that would be a simple, uh, you, that way you've got water on the craft when you need it, and at the same time, that water can be used as a tool to help you turn in the direction that you would like to go. That sounds um, like a submarine, another, right? Ballast in a submarine? Exactly, exactly. Like ballast in a submarine. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that's the best way for our viewers and our listeners to be able to understand what's going on. Then there's also a theory I have on our the United States craft, the TR-3B, uses thrusters to do the same thing. They have thrusters at three points, or in a UFO, you could have three-point thrusters, or you could have four-point thrusters. 
but I think that would be a little bit more difficult to use on a UFO because you're trying to make this thing as aerodynamic as possible. Is it possible that rather than shifting weights inside the craft, there's some method of shifting the fields? Well, my, my third theory is that on some of these UFO pictures that we see, we see three balls underneath the craft. And I begin to wonder if maybe these three balls are statically charged. They're like half circles or half balls mounted on the bottom of the craft. And so anytime you see three or four of an object, uh, for me anyway, I think that there's a high probability that they're being used as some form of stabilization or some form of turning. Right, and right. so instead of having one metal plate on the bottom of the craft, you have three balls, and then you, if you want to fly straight up, you charge all three balls. If you, only, if you want to cock the craft in one direction, then you charge one or two of the balls. And that would lean the craft in one direction while uncharging, you know, turning off the other ball. And that way you can get the orientation that you want as far as what angle you want to accelerate into space with. That makes that sense. That could also be used uh, when you're in Earth's atmosphere, because basically you're just landing in the craft a little bit, but still using the static electric charge to move you along. And that's my theory on it. Uh, I have no proof of that. But to me, it kind of looks obvious when you see some of these craft. Let's take that to um, a silver UFO robo. We have a nice round disc, let's say 25 feet in diameter. If we chopped it into three parts at a straight liftoff, all three sections can be wired separately. And what would you think about if I could, if I could wire them separately and under normal flight, they'd all be charged the same. And if I wanted to turn, then I could either add a little more electricity or deduct a little bit more electricity. And the craft should lean over. And you only have to lean it a little bit, then go back to zero and you're going off in that direction. What do you think about that? Exactly. I, I totally agree with that. That seems to be the simplest, most efficient way to do it. I mean, you could put a bunch of gyros in it and spend millions of dollars creating all these gyroscopic machines that would do the same thing. But my theory is keep it simple. You know, don't overcomplicate things. And the theory. simplest way to do it would be to statically charge one of the three balls or two of the three balls or to use the ballast method. I've, I've always been a firm believer in keep it simple, and those seem like the, the simplest methods to go about doing it. If I was okay. going to fly a UFO in, in uh, the atmosphere, then I could possibly understand the, the water being shifted. It, was, it would act like a submarine. But what, what would happen in space? wouldn't matter where I put the put the water. That's You've true. got a point there, and that's where using the static electric balls or little jets, uh, little thrusters or something would probably work better. Overall, I would go with the three-ball design if I was going to be in outer space. Until I know of something different, that would probably be the most efficient form of orientation. Do you think it would be possible for me to cut the outside diameter into three different sections or would they could I push more juice over to one segment or would, would I have a problem with that electrically charged uh, one, I would, one area uh, as long as yeah if you cut it into segments say three segments or four segments and had a, um, a little bit of insulation say for example you use aluminum tape uh, you know let's do this on a poor boy idea if you just used aluminum tape over the bottom segment and then you had a little gap between each segment so that there was no arcing or a crossover, then uh, just segmenting the bottom would do the same thing, or segmenting the top, either one. If you segmented both, it would just improve how fast you could lean the craft in one direction or the other. Here's another part of my theory, and that is that you have, so you have this negative on top, and you have this positive on bottom. And when you get the current up high enough, as long as there's no arcing, then what you have now is a halo. And you say, people say, well, why do you want this halo aurora effect around the craft? Well, there is an, a second advantage to this, not just in levitation, but in actual shielding. Because you have this aurora of energy, of plasma around your craft, 
this energy is high kinetic energy. It has a high kinetic value. And people would say, well, what does that matter? That high kinetic energy or that plasma would be able to be basically a shield for your craft. And so any particles coming at you it would be the same as taking a small feather and throwing it into a torch. It's immediately just dissolved. It disappears because the kinetic energy of that plasma is so hot that anything that enters it is basically destroyed almost immediately. Bulletproof, uh, rocket proof? Well, if you know a bullet's coming at you and you know the exact moment that bullet is going to hit that shield, then at that exact moment, you can increase the charge, the, the current, just spike it just for a moment, just when that bullet first hits it, and that immediate spike will should dissolve that bullet. And then, of course, if your craft is made of like uh, carbon fiber or some unknown material that's really, really strong, that would take the rest of the hit, which would probably be minor. It would be like throwing sand at a basketball. It just would have no effect, really. That's my theory on that. But there is also a third theory, that, a third bonus that goes along with this. If you can get the plasma cycling at the correct frequency, I believe it's highly probable that you can bend the light around the craft and actually make the craft invisible. So here you have a plasma like a TV screen. Well, you have, there are TV screens that are plasma. A lot of the old TVs the, um, were actually had plasma in them that were controlled by an electron gun. So it would make common sense that why not control this plasma to bend and manipulate light to make yourself look like a, a cloud or make yourself totally invisible. I am not an expert in invisibility, but we've well, all seen... Uh, say that, that again, Amy? I was going to say that would certainly uh, help explain why these crafts seem to have the capacity to disappear and appear more or less at random. I agree with you, Amy. Uh, we see this a lot, and especially in UFO videos on YouTube that are created here in the past uh, 10 to 20 years. And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of debunkers are like, oh, no, that's uh, CGI. That's fake. I, my, my friend here, Dwem, uh, he's really good at picking out fake photos. And we have a lot of photos available on Pegasus that the members all agree are not fake photos. They are not CGI. These are real photos. These are real mm -hmm. videos of real things happening. Yeah. And, uh, and yes, Robo. And uh, yeah. once in a while, once in a while, even if a UFO disappears off of what we would call visual sight, I can still process it and find it. So they can't hide from me too well. As far they as can... I'm concerned, you have the best uh, photo analysis out there at this time in history. I highly recommend if anybody has a photo they'd like to send to Pegasus, uh, we will give it its blessing or its curse. I, I feel like we have some very serious professionals on here. And as far as I know, we have no paid shields. We do not welcome shields on Pegasus. Let that be known to everybody. This That's is professional, right. serious what we do. Okay. How about uh, <laughs> something that's really of interest to myself is the Van Allen belts. Can, do you have any more information on those? On What do you think would happen if a flying saucer went right through them, or should they avoid them? Which is your opinion? Well, go around uh, them or go through them? Or it doesn't matter? Well, uh, there's also what I call the fourth bonus to this plasma shield around the craft. And that is, there's a patent out. Um, I cannot find it right now. I've been looking for it. But basically what it says is that if you ionize the skin of the craft, they did this with a blimp at one time. There's a patent out of a blimp that had its skin ionized. And what they found out was is that there was almost no resistance, uh, wind resistance. So basically, you have a bonus there of while this craft is, has a plasma field around it, there's no wind resistance. And because of the voltage that's coming off this craft, this kinetic energy field, there's a high probability that it is protecting you from the gamma rays and the X-rays that are out in, and the cosmic rays that are out in outer space. Especially, as we know, X-rays are created in the 100,000-volt range. 
Well, if the skin of the craft is at 100,000 volts, then what's going to happen is any X-ray particles coming towards that craft are going to be repelled. And as you get into higher voltage gradients, not only are X-rays going to be repelled from the craft, but gamma rays and cosmic rays. And so, actually, the inside of the craft is really well shielded from radiation from, for example, the Van Allen belt. There's even a high probability that if the sun is just a ball of gas and not a solid, that a craft could actually fly through the sun as long as it did it really, really fast and had the shielding. Fascinating stuff. Let me see if I can find that, that patent reference real quick. Yeah, because really, I need to I need to mention the the energy that w- uh, how the energy would be created, and my theories on that. Uh, flying through the sun, Robo flying through the sun. Do you think he can do that all the way right through the center? There's nothing in the middle, like molted lead, or I mean, all these asteroids and stuff for millions of years pound in the sun. Is, do you think they just all get evaporated, or what? Well, I'm not a astrophysicist. I don't know the absolute facts, but from what has been said, they say that the the sun is basically a ball of gas. If there are any heavy elements in it, they're going to be of a high energy level, but are they going to be of a higher energy level than what that craft is? As long as the shielding holds up and the, the density of the material in the sun is low enough, then I would think it is possible just as a bullet cannot be shoved through with a hand into a concrete block but if that bullet is traveling at a fast enough speed it'll cut through a concrete block like it is nothing it all comes down to how much kinetic energy one object has compared to the other object that's going to be impacted right Mm. right hey robo i was wondering what what you have relative to information about T. Townsend Brown and the flame jet generator. You know, um, that was one of the hardest patents for me ever to get from the patent office. It may have just been at the time or whatever. Um, Supposedly it's available on the internet now. But the time that I originally did the research, that was one of the hardest patents for me to get access to. From what I've seen of it Hmm. and the copy I've seen, there, there are... You have basically, you have a jet, and on the end of this jet, you have these ever-increasing copper cones. And as this jet, this flame jet, is originally charged at, say, 100,000 volts, so that means the flame itself coming out of that jet, that plasma, is 100,000 volts, let's say, for example. Well, when it goes through the first cone, the first cone, it charges to 100,000 volts. Well, then the next cone behind it, there are insulators that these cones are mounted on to keep one cone from sparking over to the next. But what happens as each cone gets larger, it increases the voltage gradient, which increases the charge on the plasma coming out of the jet. So after three or four of these copper cones, you start out with like, let's say, 100,000 volts. By the time that jet gets out of that fourth cone, it could be a million or five million volts coming out of it. And because of this, that is that would benefit you as far as your voltage gradients that you're trying to apply the energy to. One of the difficulties in creating high voltage with, uh, let's say, a generator is that with AC electricity, all you have to do to step up the voltage is to run it through what's called a step-up transformer. With DC voltage, it's a lot harder. With DC voltage, you can't just step it up using a transformer. The technology that's available to the average Joe, what you would have to do is start out with a a generator that creates AC electricity. Then it steps it up through transformers to different voltages. Then after that, that voltage, let's say you step it up to, uh, it starts out, let's say, at 1,000 volts. You step it up to 10,000 volts. And then you step it up to 100,000 volts. All right, now this is AC. Well, then you have to send it through a diode that will convert it into direct current instead of alternating current. That is the normal way that the DC voltage is created. And the reason you need this is because you need these voltage gradients. You need to be able to step up the voltage as you get deeper into space. Now, right, you don't right. have to 
Yeah, excuse me, Amy? I just said right. <laughs> I'll say left if you want. Um, left. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so basically, um, you know, once you get above 100,000 volts, the propulsion should be there. It's just that if you're able to get up into the millions, the billions, or maybe even the trillions of volts, then your speed should increase tremendously. Just as the scientists have recently found the Higgs boson particle, and to find that, they were using 4 billion volts. Well, the opposite could be said that every atom out there has a Higgs particle. So if you're able to have a craft that can produce 4 billion volts, then that craft should be able to grab a hold of the Higgs particle and use it for its acceleration. And because of that, you should improve your speed and improve basically your traction in outer space and the vacuum of space. And also the ionization potential, the, uh, the shielding, the plasma. And so the higher the voltage gradients that you can create this craft, then the higher kinetic energies, the higher um, shielding you will have, the less resistance to uh, particles in space that are going to slow the craft down. And these are all benefits. We're right down to the last minute of our segment here at the end of the show. So any last thoughts, Robo, Amy? My, my final theory is that the UFOs that our government is using right now have nuclear-powered generators in them. I've come upon this theory by many reasons. One, so-called men in black are actually what are called NEST, Nuclear Emergency Search Team. They may be going by a new name, but basically anytime there's a crash, you have these guys show up. And odds are they are part of the nuclear emergency search team, and they're there to recover the nuclear engine and to clean up any waste that is on the ground so that keep us all alive. So to the NEST team out there, I want to say thank you for keeping us alive and protecting us from such dangers. Amy, any last questions for Robo? I don't have any specific questions at this time, but I do want to thank Robo for his time in helping us put this together. Yes, Robo, thank you very much. And you can find all of us on Pegasus. And this is tonight's show, which is Peggy Pods. And we've been talking to Robert Garrison, a.k.a. Robo Mott. Robo, good night. Thanks, Joel. Peggy, take me home. <laughs> <laughs>